Welcome back to another episode of Alternative Space History. I'm your host, Sonat the Hero Type. We're going to dive right into a few changes to our Dragon 1-5 series. More or less just seeing what experiments I can still collect data from since we are in short supply of it. Now, the little thing about the whole, you know, JFK quote in the beginning, I highly doubt we'll be able to get a man on the moon by 1960, but I'm definitely going to be going lunar coming up soon. We get everything prepped this year. As of next year, we should be good to go to start shooting our first probes out. If it is possible, I would love to try to get, you know, a man on the moon by 1960, but I don't know if it's actually possible. But we do make some some strives this particular year we got some altitude contracts with our space pl uh, sorry our rocket planes and then we are jumping into the world of automated rocketry but that will be for a little bit later as i stated before we're just kind of making some minute changes to the dragon series just to kind of more or less i'm going to be using this to collect a little bit of science because we are pretty close to capping out on everything in low earth orbit but there are a few experiments that could still net us some science we are waiting for the descent to unlock or sorry the descending techno to unlock so i can get the heat shields so i can send up the advanced biological unit which i have gotten like 0.1 units of science from so we can collect a good chunk of science from that as well as Get the bonus science from returning something from orbit, and that should be enough to get us to where we can unlock everything we need to go lunar. But launching off here, we have our first launch of the year, which is the Dragon 1-5 with the SciSat 2, which is just a more beefed up satellite version that can last longer in space. And I did have a little bit of an issue on the launch pad because I hit the staging button too fast, but we were able to recover. This is just going to do an atmospheric analysis contract just to get a little bit of funding going. I do definitely have tons of funding as is, and I'm going to be getting a lot more here shortly. But until I get my first MechJeb rocket designed and built, I usually try to keep a little nest egg just in case. We are uh, cutting these flights up a little bit since you've seen these a few times, but the AJ-10 burned perfectly. Everything went according to plan, and we were able to nail that contract. The thing I hate about this contract is you have to do the temperature in the barometer scan. And I already have a max, so you gotta do the force run thing. And you gotta wait for it to transfer data. So I actually had to sp go around Earth a few times for this contract to complete. But I didn't want to bore you guys with that, so I just kind of cut this out. We made it to orbit. Eventually the contract did finalize, and then we went back to the space center. But with that, we got our second launch underway of the X05 WH2, uh, Mr. J. Fox Kerman. It's his third career flight, and he's aiming for a 65 kilometer altitude attempt. Now, I was getting a little nervous with these altitude contracts purely because this capsule is rated for 75 kilometers. Anything more is a little bit dangerous. They can survive if we peak that 75 mark. I would just rather be safe than sorry. We are in the middle of researching the official quote-unquote X-15 cockpit, which is rated for suborbital reentry, and it can go a little bit higher into the atmosphere, and that is where we're going to be doing our Carmen Line contract, as well as a few other contracts as well, hopefully, at that time. But because we are focusing on going lunar, we will be more than likely putting that on the back burner for the time being, because next year is all about collecting science getting to the moon, or getting a probe to the moon, and kind of moving forward with that. Once we get the science and get the research going, I will be finalizing that capsule research, and then we will go ahead and get that rolling. But as you see here, J. Fox was super successful in his flight until this happened. I tried to turn around a little too sharp in the thicker part of the atmosphere, and unfortunately this plane is not very stable. It's designed for speed and height. It's not designed to glide super well, and unfortunately, I overshot the KSC by a lot. Like, I really overshot it. I That was on me. I should have set the starting distance back a lot farther than I did. But he did manage to survive. He did have a little bit of a spin on the way down. And he probably threw up in the cockpit. But we're not going to hold that against him. Either way, this will be the final flight of this particular, you know, rocket plane. We're going to have to re go ahead and uh, rebuild it. But we are going to be doing some touches, touching up on this design. 
and it's more or less because I wanted to test something out in prerequisite to the X07, which will be the official suborbital rocket plane. Which we're going to pop over the VAB right now and do that. Um, I added a couple of these Tiny Tim boosters. You see I took that two twin parachute set up and I put a singular one down. Uh, this will be the WHT or White Hawk Turbo as I am unoriginal and that's all I can think of. But we're going to stop a couple of these SRBs on there because I want to see exactly what kind of dis uh, difference it makes during a kickoff stage when you do the initial launch. Um, more or less, I just wanted to test it on this craft before I actually apply it to the X07 design. But here's our third launch with the Dragon 1.5 with another SISAT 2. And this was not contracted. We were pretty much just finishing up the collection of science we could. Since the last probe didn't quite have enough electro electronic charge to finish up some of the more longer experiments. That time I kind of tapped a wing on one of the... Uh, launch clamps and that's what the little jiggle was on there but we were able to again once again recover it and we weren't really aiming for anything special we did go for a polar orbit since there was some of the visible imaging we could pick up which works better in a polar orbit and since this has enough power to last for about 26 to 36 days depending in space I figured we might as well just go ahead and send this one polar since we have the other one orbiting normal Again, pretty uneventful flight, everything went according to plan. At this point, the engines we're using for the Dragon series are are pretty reliable at this point. They're all within, you know, a 1% to 4% ignition failure rate, so I've been pretty happy with them. But right here is where we grab our first lunar contracts, and I'm going to be grabbing the flyby and the impactor contract, because you can actually stack those together. And the reason I'm doing that is because, one, I need to build the next launch pad, and I need to upgrade my tracking station. Those two things combined is about $450,000, which is exactly pretty much what those two contracts give you. Um, I haven't finished the Lunar Communications. I do have it researching, but I haven't finished it yet, so unfortunately, I can't upgrade my tracking station as of yet. But now we're over in the VAB, and we are going to be building the very first OSIRIS launch vehicle. And again, OSIRIS stands for Orbital Satellite Insertion Remote intelligence something I keep forgetting what it is and it's driving me crazy but I wanted to go with the cool acronym and Osiris is what I landed on I will probably like put a thing in there of what it's called like text it out because I am bad at talking either way this is gonna be a very very similar to my last series it's gonna be using the two LR 79 side boosters with that one uh, single LR 105 main stage core in the center this is actually a very common, very easy to build, easy to use rocket early game. Um, it does great for you know basic satellite contracts and stuff like that. We do go ahead and remove the AJ-10 stage. I kind of wanted to test a few things. Um, the AJ-10 stage is nice, but it's not required for what I'm going to be using this for. So we end up pulling that off. And a little bit later, once I upgrade that launch pad, I'm probably gonna go ahead and add the AJ-10 stage, a more beefier variant of it. And we're going to be using that for our uh, lunar insertion stage. And then we'll be upgrading pretty much the rocket you see us building here. Uh, the OSIRIS, that would be the OSIRIS-2 at that point, which will be a four booster variant of the same rocket using the upgraded orbital rocketry engines that we will be unlocking a little bit later. And that is pretty much the rocket I'll be using to do my lunar contracts. I do also make some changes to that uh, set up with that probe core. I put the heat shield on the bottom and the SRBs on the top with the parachute. Uh, aesthetically, it looked more pleasing to me. I didn't bother to record that because it only took me about 10 15 seconds in the VAB to make that adjustment. And at the speed I play back my build footage at, it would have just kind of been a blink. Either way, this is our fourth launch of the year, the X05 Whitehawk 3. And we're going to have Ziggy Kerman attempting to break the 1500 meters per second uh, speed record, or I guess a speed barrier, which is pretty much like Mach 4.5. This is his fourth career flight, and pretty much the, the goal here was to climb to about 30k altitude and get out of the thicker parts of the atmosphere, and then pretty much just dump the throttle straight down and just go for it. Um, it was pretty straightforward. I knew I had enough fuel to accomplish this as long as we were able to get out of the thicker parts of the atmosphere soon enough 
and pitch down fast enough to stay within the prograde marker because when you're in the prograde marker you're using the most the least least amount of drag which gives you the most amount of acceleration and fuel efficiency as you saw there it got kind of skippy and i don't I, it was actually my cortana opening up on my computer for some reason i'm not sure why it opened up but it was making my frame rate drop horrifically and made landing kind of a pain which you'll you'll see a little bit later little spoiler we do land the plane but right here we complete the contract we actually hit 1530 meters a second which is our new speed record as of now so we're gonna go ahead and have Ziggy bring her home Ziggy's had four flights and unfortunately he has yet to land on a runway so this was his big break um, we made some adjustments to the plane. We got the aerodynamic profile set. We got the air brakes to work how we want them to. And we did come in a little hot. But you see here, th this is normal speed frame rate. It was super laggy. And right about here, it just smoothed out. Right before the landing, which was perfect, we did hit a little hard. But the plane was saved. No one was hurt. And everything ended up fine. And this is Ziggy's first time landing on the launch pad. Now we're going to pop back over to launch five, the first Osiris launch. And I am getting this really, really annoying glitch with the launch pad. I have yet to figure it out, but it makes my rocket sit super high up the launch pad and I hate it. It looks terrible. Hopefully I will get that figured out by Osiris two. One of my mods is conflicting. I uninstalled a few of them to see if it helped and it didn't. But this is a, our first Mech Jeb launch. We're just going for a real basic 160, 165 orbit, if I'm correct. And we're pretty much just going to launch this little probe unit up with the advanced biological unit, which I gave about one day, 14 hours worth of power. It's going to fly up. It's going to collect all 40 units or 39.9 units of science and then deorbit itself, which will give us about 50 points of science, which will be awesome. I also decided to do a little bit of a slow motion uh, separation shot there for you guys because I think it looks cool. I have no other reason for it other than that it looks cool. And better time warp is great for that. Either way, this flight actually went off without any issues. The LR-105 I was a little nervous about since we just unlocked that engine. And I, the burn through rate on the LR-105 isn't an extremely low chance. But for the first few launches, it's high enough to make me nervous. But everything turned out okay, and we got into orbit with actually about 500 meters a second to spare, which is kind of what I wanted because I want this to be able to do a little bit heavier payloads later on, if necessary, or be able to do lighter payloads to higher orbits. Either way, we got a clean separation, and we're just going to kind of warp around for a while until we hit that 24-hour mark and collect all the science, which I don't make you guys sit through I cut most of it out and we're gonna come back during the deorbit burn which is just those SRBs firing retrograde real basic real simple and unfortunately this is a very long fall so I did cut, cut part of this out as well mostly like the 140 to like the the part where it gets spicy I guess um, because again, it's kind of boring to watch this thing because it, it does pretty much like a complete orbit before it comes down low enough to bleed off speed. Um, that's just the unfortunate thing about these early descent builds, um, limited control on them. But we have phased back over here to the uh, fun part of the re-entry, the scary part of the re-entry. You see, I had that ablator screen pulled up because I wanted to see exactly how much ablator this was going to eat. So later down the road, I could maybe shave a little off to save some weight. Um, we barely used a quarter of it, so I'll probably use about half the ablator from here on out. And just to save ourselves a little bit of weight, because that's very important early on in uh, these return contracts. I also did grab the orbital return. Actually, technically, it's a suborbital return contract, which paid out a lot of money, um, which we complete with this launch. And then we'll be going ahead and doing a couple other... We'll be doing another Osiris launch, uh, beginning of next year, actually, because it didn't make it out to the launch pad by the end of this year but we will be doing another osiris launch with another contract pretty much the same thing as this but it's just to get that funding to kind of make sure our station is a our, our space center is afloat 
that way we can uh uh, I guess flex on these giant science games we just got, but that way we can make sure we have you know enough funding hanging around. That way we don't have to really worry about going bankrupt and being able to dump extra points into our uh, upgrades like we're doing now because it was desperately needed. I'm still trying to keep a small nest egg as of now. Once I get the first lunar contract finalized, I'll probably, probably start spending money like crazy, but. We're going to hop over to our R&D building and unlock the Deep Space Avionics and the next orbital rocketry node as well as the early flight control I believe is what it's called. It's the RCS thing and it basically gives us a little RCS thruster that we can use to basically act like a small engine. Uh, mostly because they don't have an ignition, uh, they don't have any limited ignitions as well as they're great for early lunar orbiters, especially small ones. So that's kind of why we went that way. Plus, we get some more RCS upgrades that we desperately need. But we're going to pop over to Launch 6 in the X05 Whitehawk 3, where we're going to have Oliver Kerman attempt to break the altitude record set by Jay Fox earlier this year, reaching for about 70k. Again, these particular cockpits are only rated to do up to 75, so I actually end up cutting the engines a little early. We take this really aggressive pitch to start off with, mostly because I didn't want to overshoot, as well as we have the thrust ability to do that with these this twin engine setup we have going on. And, well, yeah, but we ended up cutting the engines off a little early because I didn't want them to get too high in the atmosphere. Uh, we did break the 70k mark, we actually got closer to 72.8 I believe, and yeah, no one died. But pretty much at this point we're just going to have Oliver bring the plane back down to the runway, which as you can see we didn't overshoot this time. He managed to nail a new altitude record, and because of these clouds right here, I could not see the Space Center. Which is a problem because I was a little off kiltered and I, I can start started to see it about here and I realized I am not going towards the runway I still have too much speed to bleed off and I didn't think I was gonna be able to get lined up in time so we decided to go for a grass landing just outside the KSC rather than risk trying to get straightened out and you know crashing the plane but we did have a successful landing no one died and you know what I'll take it either way uh, we're going to phase right back over because that was our final launch of the year, and that is pretty much where this episode is going to end. So I want to go ahead and thank you guys again for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to check out the Discord. I will leave the link in the comment. If you enjoy the content, feel free to like and subscribe. We've almost broken 80 subs, which is awesome. And, well, at this point, I am pretty much just killing time until the outro music comes by. So, uh... I don't know. I guess, uh, bye. Hope I see you guys next time in the year 1957.